Dr. Larry Crabb is um, back with me again this hour. We're talking about his book, 66, 66 Love Letters from God to You, a conversation with God that invites you into his story. We're dealing with the first five books of the Bible and uh, it's very difficult in this short period of time to be too comprehensive. I want to skip forward to De De Deuteronomy. Hmm. It's interesting in Israel, where I lived uh, for seven years and pastored King of Kings Church, uh, I spent a lot of time with rabbis, uh, friends of mine, neighbors of mine. And when we planted the church, they were very mm -hmm. intrigued because mm -hmm. they thought, how can this guy come into this Jewish city and yeah. plant a Protestant evangelical church? But they, they were very encouraging, not discouraging. But in, in the process of my uh, interaction with them, uh, time and again, as we would talk about the scriptures, Deuteronomy would come up. Huh. Because they saw it, as you say, rightly, in, in, in 66 love letters, it was Moses' sort of last will and testament. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of his last yeah, sermon. Right. And in many ways, <clears throat> Deuteronomy, uh, for the rabbinic tradition, um, set the, the bar, sort of established the DNA of what eventually would emerge in the, in the Talmud. Um, you say something here, however, that just is so absolutely uh, stunning and profound. And I think we need to spend this entire segment on, on this one sentence. Okay. You have God speaking here to you uh, in response to uh, some more whining. <laughs> <laughs> it's my spiritual gift. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. You whine, you complain, you, you, you fret. And you... Anyway, the Lord says, your love is sustained by confidence in my character, mm. not by enjoyment of current blessings. Mm. Now, Larry, I don't mm. know if you know this or not, but you are flying full in the face of, I would say, a 20th century uh, fad and trend that began maybe post-Second World War that continues to this day in many parts of uh, the U.S. and Canada. This triumphalist view of Christianity yes. Yes. where if you come to Jesus, <clears throat> Not only do you win in the end, mm -hmm. but you win, you now. win now. You win now. Uh, and, and, and you have blessing, you have comfort, you have healing, you have victory. Uh, you are one up on your neighbors. Yes. You're saying that that's not what Deuteronomy is telling us. Now, there's a verse in Micah that's rendered something like this. I won't be able to quote it exactly, but the gist of it is that. Um, if somebody comes along with, um, with a warm smile and a glib tongue and says to you that God will give you anything you want, then you'll hire him on the spot as your preacher. And God is, that's God speaking and God's saying, that's not what I have in mind. Because see, what I think we do is we confuse what C.S. Lewis called first things and second things. You know, Lewis said, if you, if you, if you live for first things, then second things are thrown in eventually. But if you live for second things, you lose both first and second things. Right. Now, the blessings of life. I like blessings. <laughs> I like good health. I like a wonderful wife. I like healthy grandkids. I like two sons that are walking with the Lord. I mean, I got blessings coming out of my ears. But if I'm depending on those blessings for my joy, ultimately, I'm an idolater. Yeah. What I need to depend on is who God is, the character of God, His nature that is revealed in the Trinity, the way He operates. I got to depend on Him as my first thing. And if I'm not doing that, then if blessings are withheld, then I'm in trouble and I have no guarantee blessings will not be withheld. Now, what are we talking about when we talk about the character of God? Is he some kind of uh, Santa Claus in the sky who knows when you're sleeping and knows when you're awake and knows when you've been bad or good? Uh, is that what we're talking about character or are we talking about some kind of beneficent old man stroking his beard saying boys will be boys when he looks at our human behavior? Or, or, or are we talking about something else? Are we Are talking about the most profound lover that the human mind could even possibly imagine? Are we talking about somebody who, um, Jonathan Edwards, um, I think America's maybe the greatest theologian we ever produced, he, he says this, he says, the whole purpose of creation, and this is a weird sentence to me, the whole purpose of creation is to communicate the happiness of the Son of God. Hmm. Was Jesus happy? He was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. He got rejected. Even his friends fled and deserted him. He gets nailed to a cross. What's the happiness of Jesus? And my answer is, the happiness of Jesus consists entirely in the fact that he wants to delight the Father. He wants to, he loves his children. And what he's basically saying is, my very nature is to give. 
and that's his happiness. God is a giver. He's not a getter. He's a giver, and his character is one of inflexible holiness, which means if you're going to enjoy my party, then you've got to share in my nature, but you've violated my nature, so I've got to give you a new nature. And he gives us his character. Second Peter 1, 4 says we're participants in the divine nature. What on earth is he talking about? That's a, that's a Dickens of a sentence in my mind. That's what it says. We're, we're participants in the divine nature, which means that if I'm going to have faith in the character of God, this character is somebody who absolutely loves. That's the essence of his holiness. And he's going to give me that same renewed capacity that I lost when I told God to take a hike. Well, okay. okay. <laughs> If God, if God's character is 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 profound, uh, abiding, everlasting love, how does a guy feel when he's stricken with cancer and the surgeon is about to cut him open? Does he lie there in his bed at nighttime when no one else is around? He's not ministering to other people, <laughs> and he starts navel gazing and saying, "What's up with this God? I mean, if you love me, why this?" Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I don't know anybody who doesn't do that. So, 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 how, how did you, how did you deal with that? Well. Oswald Chambers said that the root of all sin is the suspicion that God isn't good. Excuse me? The, the, the root of all sin is the suspicion that God isn't good. Isn't good. Yeah, it looks like he's not good. Yeah. Um, Stephen Curtis Chapman, a wonderful singer, yeah. um, wasn't too many, too long ago, too many months ago mm -hmm. when his son drove over uh, by total accident, obviously, the little four-year-old daughter Maria, she yeah. might have been five. Yeah. Well, I've talked to Stephen and Mary Beth and they're, they're, they're hurting. I mean, of course they're hurting. Mm -hmm. And the question that you have to ask is, God, couldn't you have stopped it? Yeah. Couldn't you have arranged, if you're sovereign, you're omnipotent, you could do anything? Why would you allow that to happen? Why would you allow this guy to have cancer 13 years ago? Why would you allow the possibility of it's coming back being real? Why would you, I have no guarantee it's not going to come back. Um, and so that means I have to ask, well, God, if you are good, which you claim to be, then I have to ask, what are you up to? What is the central thing that you're devoting your power to these days? And you're not devoting your power, obviously, to keeping me from cancer. You're not devoting your power to keeping little girls safe from being run over by cars. You could, but you're not. What are you doing? And I think that's a huge question. But the answer is, he's transforming me to be like his son. At any cost to himself and at any cost to me. And if I don't like that idea, I'm not going to like Christianity. Now you make the point in your book that when we suffer, we sometimes forget that God suffers on a magnitude far greater oh, than what we suffer. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you know, I, I, I thought as I was reading it of uh, an analogy that I have drawn from time to time. Uh, a mother is holding her child who is suffering from a high fever and some kind yeah. of affliction. She suffers on yes. a level greater, far greater yes. than what the baby is suffering. Yes, absolutely. Um, who does God go to for comfort? <laughs> Within his own community. <laughs> I mean, he is the one who knows the end from the beginning. He's the one who knows that his plan is on track even when there's terrible suffering. Apparently, he thinks, with his wisdom that I don't share all the time, obviously, apparently he thinks that the end result, the party forever, is worth whatever we go through now. And apparently, the suffering now is necessary. God is not conquering physical evil. He's conquering moral evil in any follower that comes after him. Moral evil. Obviously, with his perspective, there's a lot more to this story than we realize. Oh. I, I wish sometimes we could just for a moment see the end from the beginning. Yeah. It really would throw a, a different light on what we're going through now, wouldn't it? Well, and I think that's what love letters are for. Yeah. It doesn't give us the entire picture, yeah. but it gives us all we can assimilate. Thank you, Dr. Larry Crabb. This is just terrific. Uh,